Um, what I'm going to present to you, I'm with the Asian Development Bank. I'm um, based out of Bangkok and I manage a program called the GMS, Greater Newton Subregion Core Environment Program, which you're going to hear more about uh, tomorrow in another presentation. My presentation today is about a, a regional investment framework that the GMS countries are putting together, which ADB has been supporting for the last 20 years uh, as part of the GMS-wide uh, economic cooperation program. So the, my uh, presentation will first touch on the this broader GMS economic cooperation program, then um, I'll, I'll uh, explain a little bit the, uh, the strategic framework for GMS economic cooperation that was um, um, agreed by the countries in last year. Then I'll mention, I'll explain the regional investment framework and what implications that has for uh, what we are talking about today, which is green growth and green uh, green economies. Okay, so um, just to give you a very brief uh, overview of the GMS Economic Cooperation Program, it was started when six countries of the GMS region, which are Cambodia, the uh, People's Republic of China, in the case of uh, People's Republic of China, it addresses, uh, it covers two provinces of China, which is Yunnan and Guangxi provinces, and then uh, Camp Lao, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. These countries came together in 1992 to establish a cooperation program for economic, um, for economic cooperation, and it's um, they identified as their vision a more integrated, prosperous, and harmonious region. It's built on three principles called the three C's, which is improved connectivity, connectivity through better, uh, better infrastructure connectivity, as well as uh, and other types of connectivity, improved in competitiveness by addressing issues such as trade or um, transport logistics and, and, and in uh, information communication technology. And finally, um, in identifying a shared sense of community uh, to address some of the shared natural resource type issues that they face. Uh, since 2000, since 92 and uh, at the end of 2011, this program had invested uh, around $15 billion worth of investments in the, in the region. Uh, most of these investments had gone into infrastructure projects. Um, and if you, next slide please. Um, and this is just a snapshot of what the region looked like in terms of roads, telecommunication, and power transmission lines in 92. Mm -hmm. Then you move to, nine, uh, to 2010, that's what was happened, that, uh, that was the case. And then moving forward, this is what it's going to look like in 2015 going towards 2020. So as you can see, the, the region is crisscrossed with lots of infrastructure, and that has significant implications for um, natural resources and, uh, and for ecosystem services. Okay. So in 2011, December 2011, the countries, the, um, at the leaders of the GMS countries came together to agree um, on um, a continuation of this economic cooperation program. They, they reaffirmed their commitment to this program by developing what's called the um, strategic framework for the next 10 years, 2012 to 2022. And I'm just going to very quickly go through what's in it. Um, but uh, so the, the vision, again, was reiterated as being more integrated, more prosperous, harmonious, and, uh, and a harmonious sub-region. The goals were to accelerate um, sustained economic growth, to, to reduce poverty, improve quality of life, and to manage natural and environmental resources sustainably. There, were, there are three um, strategic, uh, sorry, five strategic thrusts, and I won't go into detail about them, um, but basically to work together um, on strengthening <coughs> infrastructure, um, facilitating cross-border trade and investments, with, uh, address in, um, promoting more private sector support, enhancing private sector support, human resource capacity to develop and, and to promote better management of environment. Okay, and so um, this strategic framework was then in, um, translated into, a, into an action plan, if you like, by trying to mobilize resources. And, and the regional investment framework is essentially 
a pipeline of investments that the countries have now started to put together in order to mobilize resources for this for this invest uh, for this strategic um, partnership. Um, and sorry, if you could just go back to the previous slide. Um, so the so the RIF is is the operational act plan coming out of the strategic framework, and it involves under the regional investment framework there were several sector assessments that were taken uh, in various sectors and it's resulted in, in this pipeline which is now uh, ranging in the, uh, at, uh, it's, it's in the range of 10 to 20 billion dollars over the next 10 years okay um, the principles of the regional investment framework are that it looks at both you know the regional dimensions of what each country's own priorities are and identifies those regional priorities uh, and identifies um, partners through development practitioners or development partners interests or, or private sector interests and so the RIF, the regional investment framework is identifying those common areas between countries needs uh, regional priorities and, and development partners priorities and it's trying to do uh, to ensure that investments are demand driven. It's, it's to try and balance both countries' invest interests, uh, but also to bring in this regional dimension, because most countries do planning in, in, at, a, at a national level, uh, and this program aims to, you know, identify the regional benefits or the synergies of doing activities uh, as a as a cross country. It ad adopts a multi-sector approach, um, implying that. Um, most of these developments have to happen as, as cross-sectoral or multi-sectoral, uh, combining various interests of various sectors. It uh, tries to un understand emerging and new uh, areas of interest or um, emerging areas, and, and also tries to um, apply a spatial prioritization to certain to landscapes. So the next steps in terms of the RIF is that this prioritization of of projects and the regional investment framework are now being finalized. The countries are, cons being put, uh, are discussing these internally and will be um, finally presented, the RIF will be presented uh, at this GMS Economic Corridor Forum which is happening in August. Um, and then will also be presented for business opportunities to identify various business opportunities at a, uh, a business forum in, in in the third quarter of this year to be determined. And then we we'll finally be endorsed by the, ministry, uh, the GMS finance ministers in December of this year. Now, how does this all translate into action? The RIF um, is then adopted by the countries and it will translate into activities or projects under various countries' national socioeconomic development plans or sector development plans uh, and also trickle down to sub-national level and be used uh, in identified projects at the provincial level through provincial land use plans or provincial sector development plans or area-based plans such as economic corridor development plans. And then finally at the local level, it will also um, have implications for local village development plans. So through the pipeline um, identified at the, at the regional level, this will translate into projects um, which will be at all those levels, and then the the feedback from monitoring and evaluation, evaluating those projects would then feed back into the subsequent assessments that will be used to do the subsequent uh, regional investment framework. Okay, so very briefly then, um, this is the process, and, and as I said, there have been several uh, assessments done on various sectors, and I'm just going to sort of give you a quick sort of snapshot of what the, what the trends are going to look like. So this is a, a very um, brief um, summary of the GMS countries economic sectors as you can see in this um, and it was mentioned earlier today that agriculture still is a predominant sector for many countries that's the case in Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar for instance. Uh, more than a third of their economies are driven by the agriculture sector. When it comes to manufacturing, it's mainly focusing or concentrated. The largest uh, regions or countries that have manufacturing sectors are Thailand and Guangxi province of, of China. Um, manufacturing 
in these two areas are quite different. Guangxi province largely focuses on heavy industries, heavy duty manufacturing or food product, whereas Thailand's manufacturing is, uh, sector is focusing on automotives or what are called um, consumable items and so on. Um, in tr the, is, as I mentioned, as a result of mainly as a result of the transport networks um, across the region, um, trade across the region has in, uh, increased substantially just in the last 10 years. Intra-regional trade has increased sixfold, 600%. Um, and particularly, as you can see, Thailand and Vietnam have increased intra-regional trade. But if you look at a percentage gain, uh, both China and Vietnam are the largest, uh, um, achieved the highest gains in terms of intra-regional trade. Uh, between 2001 and 2010. Now another trend is that uh, the whole region is increasingly becoming urban. At the moment it's, um, it's around 30% um, that is uh, urban, but the trends are, are um, all upward. Um, the, by 2040, it's ex estimated that 76 million people will live in urban areas. That's a five-fold five increase of urban population as opposed to the entire population growth of the region. So there's a massive increase in urbanization across the region. And so this is what the GMS region is going to look like. There, there are, these are the main economic corridors, if you like. There are several going north-south, um, and, and there are couples that go east-west as well. The southern economic corridor, which is the one at the bottom end is, is considered to be the most promising economic corridor in terms of economic growth. And that's largely because most of the deep sea ports are, are located in, along the southern economic corridor. For instance, Ho Chi Minh City, um, um, and in Thailand you have Lem Chang, Lem Chabang, I think it's called, and Sihan um, Gwil, and um, possibly very soon a port in Dawai, which is going to extend the southern economic corridor um, to, towards Myanmar. Yeah, so here's, um, here's what it all looks like. And, and another, another interesting trend um, or useful trend to look at is um, tourism. As, as some of you may have heard that Bangkok recently uh, passed London or Paris, I, I can't remember which one it was, as the most visited city in the world. It's now the most visited city in the world. and, and just in the last year, tourism in arrivals in, in Thailand increased by 3 million. Um, and, and that's the trend across the region. So you have massive tourism inflows, um, which are going to also create a lot of economic uh, growth for the region. Now, what, is, what does all this mean for, for conservation areas, conservation landscapes? Um, so if you sort of map all these developments along in the, in the GMS, landscape, you see where you, you've got various metropolitan areas that are emerging, um, areas which are considered um, supporting these metropolitan areas or connecting to the hinterlands, uh, where urban rural developments would take place. You have border towns where special economic zones are, are starting to emerge and, and produce a lot of trade uh, or fi finished products. And so there's all this development taking place. And if you then um, overlay on that our GMS, what I call the economic uh, or conservation landscape, you see that many of these economic corridors then start um, impinging or intersecting with uh, what are very important um, conservation areas, including protected areas. And so the challenge for us, and in fact for most of us here looking at green growth and green economy, is how do you balance these bodies, the countries have understood them and desire as economic growth objectives with then managing these natural resources and, and economic uh, or conservation areas. And that's the key challenge that we face as the co-environment program, which is the environment arm of this GMS economic cooperation program. So in order to do this, we uh, approach this through using a, a technique called multi-criteria environmental assessment, where we are looking at the regional investment framework and applying a multi-criteria environmental um, filter uh, to, to identify what are environmental 
uh, implications of, of this investment uh, pipeline. So the, the steps in this are to first identify various parameters, environment, food, economic, as well as social. They identify the types and magnitudes of, uh, of the impacts, translate them into a map, um, then identify target areas where investments um, uh, and for good investments, as well as identify in this context where environmental or natural capital or natural capital investments also are required in order to sustain the other economic sectors and then to, to provide this analysis as, um, as inputs to the regional investment framework. I'm just going to very quickly go through the methodology of the multi-criteria analysis and that's mainly to, to highlight that this is certainly not um, a complete and it's not a done deal and, and many of the tools that have been discussed here have real um, applicability to, to what we're trying to do. So the idea is to try and generate some ideas, interest on how we can work together. So in this multi-criteria analysis, um, what we have are, and, and by the way, I'm not the expert on this, the, uh, my colleague Lothar, who's sitting back there behind the column, I can't see, is, is our in-house specialist on this multi-criteria analysis, and he could probably answer questions better than I can. But basically, we have um, parameters on environment, um, on, on economics, and, and also on social. And what we've done then is applied, um, we've applied those parameters to um, a map of the GMS, <laughs> which is at a scale of one kilometer by one kilometer. So you can actually impute values on any of these parameters that are in here at a kilometer by kilometer uh, resolution. And this is where we would like to get more information, for instance, we, we don't have much information on the economic value of ecosystem services, for instance, which you could impute on or uh, actually enter here, or for instance, the, uh, the ecological footprint, which would be a composite of various types of ecological impacts of, uh, of um, any activity on, a, on, a, on this landscape. And so by doing so, you then come up with a value for, for the environmental or economic um, value of, um, of, this, uh, of a particular area. And so here's an example of that being applied to a, a road project, which um, shows that this Sioux will rural uh, sorry, Port Access Road would have a total composite rank of a value of 0 0.31, which flags the fact that, um, on it. so from an economic perspective, it, it's got a higher value, and from an environment perspective, it's got a slightly lower value. But then the fact that it, it cuts through a national protected area, the red part that the, the road goes through, gives it an even lower value. So this sort of flags up for instance, uh, the need to either realign the road, or if it's going to go through, then the need to address the environmental implications of that quite seriously. So this is just an example, and um, as I said, we can take questions on, on this approach or how other tools can sort of complement this uh, later on. Thank you.